Appreciate everybody coming out on this cool night. How many people are ready for winter? Well, I hate to tell you, it's coming whether you're ready or not, so it don't make any difference. Good to have, good to have Jeff with us. He didn't bring any of that warm weather back from Texas, I see. <laughs> anyway, good to have you here. Appreciate everyone coming out. Let's, uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, we can be here tonight and laugh and talk with each other and enjoy ourselves and help us to realize, Lord, that it's just so precious to have you as our Heavenly Father and all the benefits that go with that. We ask you to open up our word tonight, your word tonight to us, and pray that you be with all the activities and the different ministries tonight, that you will be glorified. In Christ's name, amen. amen. So we're going to have a little devotion tonight about Christmas. That shouldn't be too surprising. You know, we're going into Christmas. We've just finished with Thanksgiving. And, uh, you know, in our country, we celebrate a number of special days. And we call them holidays. And uh, on these days, as, as individuals or families or even as a country, we take the time to remember significant events and people uh, from our past. And... You know, for example, on the 4th of July, we celebrate the, the birth of our nation. We look back at those brave people uh, that declared our independence from England, knowing full well what the consequences would be. And on Memorial Day, we celebrate those people that made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. Uh, I'm glad that my dad was not one of those people. He was in the Army 30 years, and he fought in World War II in Korea, and the Lord brought him through that. But... You know, our holidays are important to our culture and to our society. But, you know, there's two, cel two holidays that we celebrate as a country that are really different from all the others, and that would be Christmas and Easter. You know, those are holidays that were being celebrated, you know, before our country was even formed. Yeah. And, and biblically, you know, there are holidays in the Bible, if you want to use that term, because there are events that happen in the Bible uh, where God miraculously would intervene for his people, and God knows human nature. He knows that if, if a significant event happens at this time, that the generation that was alive when that event took place, they will remember it. But every succeeding generation after that, what normally will happen? It, it fades away. The importance of it, the significance of it, uh, becomes less and less unless it is frequently brought to their attention, which is why we have these. For example, uh, in the Old Testament, you can, you know, you can look in, uh, in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 12. If you want to open there, it's easy to find. It's the second book in the Bible, so you find Genesis and go to the right. Exodus chapter 12. This is when the, the Hebrew people were in Egypt, and they were slaves, and, and God remembered them, and he intervened. In Exodus chapter 12, I'm just going to read verses 12 through 14. This is what uh, God said uh, to Moses before the first Passover. Now, when the Passover first took place, what was, what was going to happen? God was going to judge the Egyptian people. And what, he, what was he going to do? He was going to cause the firstborn of the Egyptian people and their livestock to die. And he gave the children of Israel specific instructions of what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to take a lamb. It was supposed to be sacrificed. The blood was supposed to be put on the side posts and the upper posts of the door. And in verse 12 of, of Exodus 12, this is what God said, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. God was going to show the Egyptians, and especially Pharaoh, that he was God, he was Lord, and the God, God's little G that they worshipped were really nothing compared to him. And he goes on and says, 
uh, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now verse 14 is the verse I really wanted to get to. And he said, And this day shall be unto you a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Amen. And even today, the Hebrew people, the Jews, they still celebrate the Passover, just like it is uh, set up in the Bible. Now, in the book of Joshua, there's another event that took place when the children of Israel were finally going into the Promised Land. Before that they could actually go in and take possession of it, they had to cross the Jordan River. And when they came to the Jordan River, what was unusual about the Jordan River when they came up to it? It was in flood stage. At that particular point in time, in places, the, the Jordan River could be up to a mile wide. And, of course, they didn't have the Army Corps of Engineers. They didn't have the CBs. They didn't have pontoon bridges at this time. And so they, when they first came to the Jordan River, even Joshua, the leader, probably said, well, how are we going to get across? Well, God had a plan, but it did involve faith. Uh, the priest had to take that first step. I can imagine what it was like when the priest walked up to the edge of this roaring river and they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant between them and the two in the front have to take that first step into the water. But, you know, God gave instructions through Joshua, and this is Joshua chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. It says, Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe of man, and Joshua said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take up each one of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in the time ahead, saying, What do these stones mean? Then you shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial until the children of Israel forever. And there are other instances in the Bible where God did great things for his people. And he had memorials established so that each succeeding generation would not forget it. Now, we're going into Christmas, and whenever I, th I think about Christmas, I automatically connect Easter to it. You know, the two holidays that we celebrate as, as a country that are religious holidays are Christmas and Easter. How many verses are there in the Bible about Christmas and Easter? Hmm? None not mentioned in the Bible. And sometimes I've thought about that, you know, you know, why? Well, maybe when we get to heaven, we'll find out why God has his reasons. I did a little research. When was Christmas first, I guess, observed? Anyone have any idea? <laughs> it was a bit before that. Actually, the first, I guess the first, I guess mention of it or the time it was celebrated was like around the year A.D. 333 in the city of Rome. But that was just for the group of believers in Rome. It didn't actually become a, I guess you could call it, call it an official uh, major Christian event or holiday until sometime in the ninth century. And we're not going to go any more into it than that because a lot of things, a lot of people look at it and say it was the church manipulated it and it was not set up for the right purpose. But I look at it this way. It was God working through the events of man for his purpose. We celebrate Christmas and we celebrate Easter for a very specific reason so that we will not forget what God has done for humanity and for each one of us. You know, he did the things that we could not do ourselves. Now, some people, when they celebrate Christmas, get really absorbed into the different activities and traditions. Some people can't wait to set up the Christmas tree. 
I've heard of people that have 15 Christmas trees in their house. All the decorations, all the lights. You know, every year there are, what, Christmas lighting contests. You know, people light up their house. You can see it from the space station. Really, I mean, if you, if you look at a satellite map of the United States during December, compare it to a satellite map at night in the middle of summer, and there's just places where it just lights up in, in December. And I'm sure the electric utility companies love it. You know, all the meters are spinning. But some people get so caught up in all the activities that, and the hustle and the bustle that they kind of lose track and lose sight of what Christmas is. Now, I'm 71 years old. Some are here older than I am. Some are here a lot younger. You know, I can think back when I was growing up in the 60s, 70s, into the 80s. And if you can think back that far and compare Christmas back then to what Christmas is today, is it the same? What are some changes that have taken place? Okay. For, for, for a lot of people, Christmas is, is about the gifts, not so much the, the, the giving as, as the getting. What else? Okay. You know, I, I firmly believe, this is my opinion only, I can't back it up from the scripture, but I believe that Satan has had a, a campaign to take Christ out of Christmas. And to me, the best example of that is probably, I guess it was in the 80s, at least by the 90s. You know, in the 80s, it seems like there was a lot, starting to be a lot of what I call pushback from our society about Christmas. You know, back in the 50s, 60s, you know, churches had, had no problem putting up nativity scenes. And then starting, I guess, maybe the late 70s into the 80s, there were a lot of people that said, well, that's, that's, that's infringing upon our rights. You're forcing your religious beliefs on us. And so it was different. But to me, the thing that really stood out was when you started, you know, was when a lot of people said, well, we are offended by the word Christmas. So what did they come out with? What else? Xmas. Well, it doesn't matter because most people look at that X, but you have taken what? The Christ out of the word Christmas. And so we see that our, our society has changed. And so I, what we want to talk about tonight is this. If Christians don't celebrate Christmas, for what it really is, who will? Nobody. Nobody. Because the world is so caught up with what, I guess, you know, what Satan has propagated or propagated through society, through culture. You know, we, we live in a society where people don't want, quote, things forced upon them that they don't agree with or they don't want to hear. So let's think about this tonight. You know, why is it important for us as believers, to celebrate Christmas in a way that it should be celebrated. It's supposed to be right in the world. Okay. Okay, everything we do is supposed to bring glory to God the Father. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, when, when, as a believer, you know, we know that we can't force our beliefs on anybody else. But if we truly experience Christmas and celebrate Christmas for what we know this value is to us, it may be that we may have friends. We may have those that notice that our attitude and our thoughts about Christmas are different than what the general society is in our culture. And it may give us an opportunity to share some things with these people. 
And what are some things that, you know, if somebody says, you know, I, I noticed that, that your, your thoughts about Christmas, what you say about Christmas, the way you act during Christmas it, it, is different. You seem to have maybe a, a happiness or a joy that nobody else has. Or maybe somebody may notice that your joy is not, is not contingent upon the gifts you may be getting or the size of the decorations or, or, or maybe, you don't, maybe you don't go to all the parties that many people go to. You know, a lot of people see Christmas as a time just to live it up and have a good time, drink and do all kinds of stuff. Huh? Only once a year, good. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know the, the current the current theme in culture is if it feels good, do it. Yeah. As long as no one gets hurt. So if you have a chance to talk to somebody about Christmas and, and what what it is, what are what are you, what are some things you can share with them about Christmas that's important? Lauren? Um, we certainly can do that. Because after all, you know, a lot of people look at Christmas and they really anticipate what? The gifts. And if somebody gives you a gift, they're giving you something, what? That you have not deserved or rated or worked for. They're not giving it to you out of a, of a debt. And how can you tie that into Christmas? Yeah, you, you can tell them that Jesus was what? The greatest gift that was ever given. You can also tell them that the birth of Jesus was, was proof that God always remembers and keeps his promise. And this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 after the first sin was committed. It tells us that, you know, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle and every beast of the field. And you'll crawl upon your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. And the next verse says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It, in other words, talks about a seed that's going to come from the woman, will bruise your head, it will be a fatal wound, and, and, uh, and the serpent's seed would bruise his heel. So this is really the first verse that where God is looking forward to what he's going to do, that one day... He is going to send a Savior. Amen. And then in Genesis chapter 3, this is when God called Abram, later to be called Abraham. And he told you, get, get out of your country, from your kindred, from your father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curses thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Amen. This tells us that the promised Messiah was going to come from the line of Abram or Abraham and, and would be Hebrew or Jewish. But in both of these passages, the key thing here is that God was saying, I will, I will. Amen. So whose responsibility was it for the Savior to come? It was God's. God said this is something I'm going to do. You can go into Isaiah chapter 9, a very familiar passage. It says, for unto us a child is born. I like it that it says, for unto us a child is born. It doesn't say, for unto us a child will be born. This verse was written like it's, it's, it, it's an assurance, it's a guarantee that it will happen. In God's mind, it had already happened. It, the right time had not occurred. But it says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and, and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forevermore. And it says... The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So once again, God is saying, this is going to happen, and I'm going to cause it to happen. Right. And so what we can tell people from this is that God remembers and keeps his promises, but also tells us that God 
has a love for people that's going to bring this about. And because of his love for us, and he understands our sin situation, we get to one of the most familiar passages is from Luke chapter 1. And it says, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. Let me turn my page here. And shall call his name Jesus. Is there something significant about the name Jesus? What does the name Jesus mean? Name that God saves. And it gives his purpose and coming. He says, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So we see that you can share with somebody that God is always true to his promises. He never forgets his people, but Christmas is also proof of something that is a great theme in the Bible, and that is God's love for people. Because it was his love that caused him to do this. You know, God could have just turned his back on humanity. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God could have just washed his hands of the whole thing and just walked away from it. But you, after they sinned, what did he do? Well, after they sinned, God returned to the garden. He gave them a chance to confess, but he never quit loving them. Now, in, uh, it also tells us that when Jesus was born, it was not an accident. It was not a coincidence. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, it tells us, but when the fullness of time was come. Mm -hmm. What does that mean, fullness of time? The right, the right time. The best time is when Jesus was born. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a man under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Mm -hmm. Jesus was born at the right time, he was born because of God's love for all people, and he was born to do something that they could not possibly do themselves, which was do away with their sin debt, do away with this sin separation between them and God, and have that relationship. Which leads us to probably what is the most familiar verse in the Bible, John 3.16. It says, For God so love the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So how would God, what would have to happen for God to be able to give his son, for, his God, for, for Jesus to be that sacrifice that was needed for our sin, what had to happen? He had to be born. It had to be a starting point. You know, we read verses in the Bible, and sometimes I think we have such a minuscule understanding of it. Have you ever thought of what it would be like to live in heaven and then have to leave it and come to earth and live as one of us? I don't think we can, because all we know is what we experience in our world around us and our life. And if you look at everything that's going on in the world today, there's really no certainty about anything. But to be in a perfect place like heaven and then to leave it voluntarily coming here to know what one day you would experience and go through, that really shows not only the love of God, but the love of Jesus. Now, Jesus was born to, I believe, to show God's love in a way that no one else could. I mean, after all, think about some of the more controversial, controversial teachings that Jesus gave. 
Love your enemy. Love those that despitefully use you. Turn the other cheek. Give them a drink. You know, give them a drink. Take care of them. And, and those are all things that have been contrary to human nature for many, many years. If somebody walks up to you and hits you, what's your natural response? Hit them back. Hit them back. Harder. If someone does something, lies to you, cheats, steals, what's your response? Well, get even with them. But Jesus said, love your enemies. The world says, get everything you can. Live for the here and now. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Don't worry about that. You know, the world says, get everything you can. And what did Jesus say? If you could gain the whole world and lose your soul, what would you gain? For eternity, you would gain nothing except eternal punishment. Yeah? That's right. Yeah, I've said this many times as a nurse. I have never taken care of one person who said, when I woke up this morning, I thought it was a great day to have a heart attack. I thought it was a great day to have a stroke. When Peggy had her event, I'm sure when she woke up that morning, that's not what she thought about. You know, when we have our prayer time, we're going to pray for Karen Bruce. You know, she had a stroke a couple of days ago, and it's not looking good. And the family is having a hard time dealing with it because a lot of times these things happen unexpectedly. And you have to have things in order before they happen. In Romans chapter 5, uh, I'm going to read verses 6 through 10. For when we were yet without strength, when we were in a situation where we had no ability, nothing to help ourselves, in due time, or once again at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth or showed beyond, beyond a shadow of a doubt his love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. We were considered to be enemies of God. That's not a word that we use a lot, but it's a very frank word and shows how our sin has separated us from God. But God's love was such that he did not let that stop him from doing what needed to be done. And he gave the most precious thing he had, which was his son. He says, uh, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So if we have the opportunity to talk to somebody about Christmas, we, we, can, we can talk about a number of things. God's not forgetting his promises. God's love and what he was willing to give for our salvation because of his love. And also, we can celebrate that God, through Jesus Christ, kept things simple. I mean, for us to be saved, what do we have to do? Believe. Just believe. believe. You know, we don't have to run five marathons, thank goodness. We don't have to get a Ph.D., go to a seminary. I mean, the plan of salvation is so simple, a child can accept it and believe it. And I like it that the simplicity is this. God, think back to when you were in school and you were taking tests. Anybody here take multiple choice tests? Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. If you get to five, you're in trouble. You know, the world 
is offended that Christianity, that God's plan of salvation is so simple. You know, John, in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. How much simpler can you get than that? And God wanted it that way. He didn't want people to get confused. He wanted people to know this is it. This is the way. Of course, man in his arrogance and pride doesn't want to accept that. Anybody remember what happened in uh, Acts chapter 16 the, with the Philippian, you know, Paul and Silas or, or Paul and Barnabas? It was either Paul and Barnabas or Paul and Silas. It must have been Barnabas. I think this was the first missionary journey. Silas went on the second one. But they were in, the, in prison in, in, in Philippi. and Of course, you know Paul and Barnabas were singing praises and hymns. And the jailer thought, boy, this is really weird. That's my uh, adding some, I mean, how many people would go to prison would be having a, a revival or having a, a praise session in prison? And, and what did the Lord do? Well, he sent an earthquake, and the Lord definitely intervened because buildings back at this time were not made to earthquake code. They didn't have steel beams and stuff. It was just mainly probably just stone and stuff, and you would have thought the whole prison would have collapsed. But what happened? Well, all the doors opened up. And, of course, the, 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 uh, the prison keeper, I guess you call him the warden, when he saw that, what did he do? He pulled his sword out. He was ready to kill himself. If you were a prison keeper or a warden in a Roman prison and your prisoners escaped, the penalty could be your death. And I guess he must have been close to where Paul was because when, when Paul saw this, he said, you know, don't hurt yourself. Wait a minute. And the, uh, the, the prison keeper brought them out, and this is uh, Acts 16, 30, and 31. said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It, it does not get any simpler than that. But what we can do as believers is celebrate Christmas in a way that brings honor and glory to God and to Jesus. And the way that we do that is kind of, you know, we can enjoy the lights and the other things. And the activities can be enjoyed too. You know, we can come together as believers or families and we can have fun times. We had a meal here last Sunday, our holiday meal, and I, I hope everybody enjoyed it. But it's by keeping the Christ in Christmas that we can truly honor God. I hope everyone takes time during the Christmas season to read the different Christmas stories. Does anyone have anything they want to comment about this? Why, why is it important for us as Christians to celebrate Christmas the way it should be. Lauren? Okay. That's certainly important. I like to sit down and read a Christmas story every year. Yes? No. Yeah, there's traditions, but as far as a uh, character who, uh, you know, lives in the North Pole and has elves making toys and keeps the list, uh, no, that's just a tradition. And there, you know, it, it, there's a lot of traditions that people believe. Okay. Well. That, that, that's our devotion for tonight. We want to take prayer requests now.